Hello everyone, welcome back to Where Japanese Sounds, where we discuss all things related to Japanese music from the 70s and 80s in particular. And if you're here for the first time, you might not know that one of the main genres we focus on on this channel is called City Pop, which is basically a very specific kind of pop music from Japan from the late 70s and all the way until the 80s. And that uh, genre of music is characterized by many influences from funk, soul, jazz, and a certain amount of mellow music. And some of the main city pop artists include people like Tatsuri Mashita, Maria Takeuchi. But one thing is for sure, you probably never ever thought you would hear the name Mussolini in any way related to Japanese music from the 80s. And this video is going to talk about how the hell this ever happened and is the album any good? So who is Alessandra Mussolini anyway? Well, she is the granddaughter of Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator. But uh, as some of you might know, her career in politics has actually only started quite recently. And before that, she had at least tried to make her career in entertainment. And she did have a few minor roles in cinema back in the 70s, 80s. She also did some modeling. But the, probably the most interesting part of the early things she has done is making a music album. But the thing that is definitely interesting about that album is the fact that it didn't come out in Italy. It didn't even come out in Europe at all. It only ever came out in Japan under the Alpha label. To be honest, I wasn't able to find any source saying exactly how Alessandra managed to find a label in Japan that was willing to accept her to do a full album despite her not having any previous background as a musical artist. But if we put our prejudice aside, we can definitely enjoy the album for what it really is, and I think it's a pretty solid CD pop album. What I find really interesting about the way they put Alessandra Mussolini on an album is the amount of space that's taken to really show the looks of the artist, not only at the front of the jacket, but also at the back, and also through the huge poster that you can find inside the album. So really, it really shows you the treatment that they gave Alessandra when making the album. It's basically uh, making her, well, look like an idol. It's, it's almost the same kind of treatment they would have given an idol album back in the day. And it's very interesting because she d doesn't, absolutely doesn't have the look that they wanted to give Japanese idols at the time, who were focused on looking young and cute. Here you can definitely see that uh, looking cute was not the intent. Anyway, more than just the appearance of the album, what I find also extremely interesting and rare for a Japanese album at the time is the composition of the tracks. And as you might notice, there are in total seven tracks, two of which are Japanese, two of which are, are English, and three of which are Italian. And that's pretty interesting to see three different languages being put inside a single Japanese album, which for the time is completely unheard of. Of course, putting uh, tracks with a lot of English uh, vocals and even complete tracks in English was pretty common, especially for city pop. But what I find particularly interesting about the tracks is that they have different arrangers depending on the language of the track. So the Italian tracks have one uh, arranger, composer, the English ones have another, and the Japanese ones have another. So when you, you know, put the needle on the album for the first time, you hear the first Japanese track at the start of the album and you hear, yes, it's city pop, but then you move on to Italian and it just sounds like a Euro pop, like your disco or something. And then the English tracks sound like something that would also be part of city pop. And as a matter of fact, for those of you who didn't know, the person who composed the English tracks for this album is actually Hiroshi Sado, who is a very well-known city pop artist. And I definitely recommend that you check him out if you haven't. So while all of that is great, the problem is if you want to listen to the album, you can only do that on YouTube or by having the record for yourself. There hasn't been any reissue since then. It's not available on streaming anywhere. And I guess we can all understand the, prob the problem behind making a reissue for that kind of album. Even though the, you know, the musical quality of the album is great, the problem is the, what surrounds the album is the fact that 
the artist isn't someone that isn't without controversy. That's the least we can say. And I guess this has stopped uh, both the alpha label and any other label really to really want to make a reissue happen. And that's why I want to focus the, the end of this video on the collector's aspect of an album like that. First, in terms of pure price, if you want to buy this record, it will set you back around $75 to $100, depends what channel you use to buy the album. But in the world of collecting records, and in particular Japanese records, this is pretty mid-range. It's not a particularly expensive album, and it's actually quite rare. And also, it has an audience built in that is, you know, not only in Japan, but also outside Japan. But if we're talking purely about uh, its collectible value, I think it's a great piece to have in a Japanese music collection, the CD Pop collection. And it's a great conversation starter. I think it's the most unique Japanese album of the 80s that I know of because of its strange story, the fact that the music is, again, pretty good, surprisingly, uh, despite the artist not really being a musician, and the fact that it has some great tunes, actually. Another Japanese idol made a cover of the first track, Tokyo Fantasy. I will put a link in the top corner for you to check it out. But the album is good, everything is good, but we can't really talk about it because there is so much stigma around it. We can't make a reissue either. And again, the price of the album is at a point where it's not, you know, it's not common enough to find that it's not a collector's item. So it does grab some attention and I guess there is no way around it. But I think it, it, it's okay to collect something if it has a good history, a good collectible value, even though everything around the album, you know, isn't perfect. It's just the way it is with collectibles. Everything has a history. And I think this one, honestly, should be worth more than that, given, you know, its unique place in Japanese music and the fact that I have never seen an album of what we could definitely call city pop made in Japan by a foreign artist. But honestly, I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Do you think that we should be able to enjoy albums like this one in a vacuum without caring about the history behind it or the persons behind the album? Is it okay to make an album like that so expensive to make it become a collector's piece and to bring attention to the album even though it might not really be needed? I really am curious to hear your opinion on that. And next time we'll probably talk about something a bit less controversial, but for now it has been Rare Japanese Sounds. I hope that you've enjoyed the video, let me know your feedback, and until next time, stay tuned.